Alright, here we go. Take one. <laughs> So there's this dog, and he got a really nice bone, and he's marching all proud down the street, and he crosses the bridge, and he looks at the reflection in the water, and he sees a bigger dog with a bigger bone. Uh, he snarls at the dog. The dog's snarling back at him. Oh, fuck. So he kind of jumps at the dog and jumps back at him. Ooh, now you want to fight. So the dog, with his bone, jumps in the water to attack the other dog and to get the other dog's bone. Now, of course, that dog surfaces wet with no bone because what he was fighting was his own reflection. Many people are fighting their own reflection, utilizing someone else, but actually, it's just them. My guest today is Paxton Dickerson, and uh, he is a motivational speaker. He's somebody that's out there inspiring, getting people excited about this new life of recovery. And before I get him on the show, though, I wanted to show you something I had made. I had some shirts made, and um, and they're sort of based on the premise of this show. And some of them, I guess you could call a little provocative. Uh, these will create some seriously great conversation starters. Let's get high, but do it clean. Logo's on the other side of the shirt. And um, this one here, this is actually how I end all of my shows. As you all know, if you were watching, keep getting high, but do it clean. And this one here, I really do like also, which uh, everybody all knows that saying, I'm high as fuck, right? High as fuck, but doing it clean. Again, these shirts are $23. That includes shipping and handling. And um, and again, it's sort of designed to promote the show. Want to get the word out. Again, what are we trying to do? We're trying to tell everybody that highness is not a problem. I get high every day. It's about how we do it. Again, highness is not a property of drugs. It's a property of people. It comes from within us. And also, if you guys saw the last podcast that I did, you can kind of see this plaque behind me. This is the plaque that I had burned uh, during those days when I was really struggling, when I was really craving. That really helped me overcome and battle those, those cravings that I was struggling with. So please stay tuned for Paxton Dickerson, and I will see you guys in a second. everybody ready to get high? I am. But before I introduce my highness companion today, I want to again thank all my listeners and supporters of the show. You know, we're a not-for-profit show, and I want to let everybody know that we're going to have some exciting episodes coming out. My guest today is someone that I met a few times a couple of years ago as I was working to get him involved in the program I was working in. I was the director of, but as the director and not the owner, I sort of became entangled in a battle between providing what I defined as good services and money. You know, when I think about treatment, and there's a reason that I'm kind of going to lead into this, I get troubled by all the emphasis that's put on evidence-based practices. And a lot of programs promote this because it sounds good to those seeking treatment. And in most cases, I guess you could say, you know, people that are seeking treatment for someone else. You know, the National Alliance on Mental Illness defines, and I want everybody to think about this, defines an evidence-based practice as one that has been researched scientifically or academically. The exercise has been proven effective and has been replicated by at least two or more studies. Also, evidence-based practices need to integrate both medically-based research along with individual patient values and the experiences of the provider that's providing this, the clinician. And you know, some of the typical, what we would define as evidence-based practices 
are practices that counselors cannot actually practice. You know, cognitive behavioral therapy, there's exposure therapy, there's functional family therapy, um, DBT or dialectical behavioral therapy. And each of these methods has been quote unquote proven effective through a range of clinical settings. And of course, cognitive behavioral therapy being the most used one. And, you know, so then we look at non-evidence-based practices and think about this in a sense, okay, cognitive behavioral therapy is directive. It is in a sense, sometimes manipulative, right? And non-evidence-based practices rely on the rapport between the clinician and the patient, less on the scientific evidence of the practice, if there is any. This type of exercise is highly individualistic, sounds bad. Traditional treatment methods, which are again the non-evidence-based, uh, tend to rely heavily on patients' preferences and the therapist's personal experiences with whatever method they're trying to do. And in some cases, clinicians may find their own experiences in this to be more reliable than evidence-based practices. And when it comes to non-evidence-based treatment methods, the patient's thought processes and their preferences are the most critical factors to the treatment process. Sounds bad. And the reason I bring this up is because, you know, there's all this uh, talk about the necessity for evidence-based Congress. You know, there's been all these meetings about the requirement they're looking to force for evidence-based practices. And since most people that come into treatment are seeking to work on a problem that they don't think they have <laughs> and to learn from someone that they don't think that they're going to learn from. And so if anybody can define to me how an evidence-based approach like CBT is really going to be effective, it's not, right? Unless you can get that person motivated, inspired, and excited about the new possibilities that could be coming their way. Creative people with new ideas are who I believe, honestly, are setting the stage for the greatest success that we can see in working with those struggling with substance abuse. Unless I can get someone interested in what we're doing, evidence-based approaches are not gonna have much value. Now, Paxton Dickerson, is the man who has that strength. He started a, a program called Mechanics of Recovery. And I am really looking forward to learning about this. He's a motivational speaker that sets the stage for helping people desire something different. Paxton, I wanna thank you for coming. I really Thank you for having me, I'm so excited. Absolutely. And I, and I want to say, you know, that um, I remember when we first met and we were talking, there's a lot of similarities that I saw between you and I in our sure. thinking, with the exception of your dress. <laughs> he is. I remember when I first saw you, man, I'm like going, damn, man, this guy is the most highly dressed person. <laughs> Thank you. Done a bit of research on you and, you know, I kind of, you know, you have really put a lot of emphasis in this thinking outside the box, this creativity, you know, to be able to put together over a hundred different treatment educational processes, you got to think outside the box. <laughs> Most definitely. Yeah. You know, I, uh, I, you know, look, I am the, I, I have born out of a 90 day treatment center. And I love the 90 day treatment center. I got everything I needed. Uh, I went through what I need to go through. I went and, you know, I, I coupled it with Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous. And I did my steps. I got a grand sponsor and a sponsor and all that stuff. And, you know, all the awesome cliches. And, you know, and I can't argue with the results. Sure. Um, in working in the field, you know, and what I did after the field, because, you know, Bill, you take Bill Wilson, you know, I got to remember that 
if I'm doing the 12 steps, the 12 steps were not the program he did. It's the results of the program he did. He did something totally different, you know, and Bill was a weirdo. He went to the church, the medical society. He went to the Masons. He went to the occult. He went to Aleister Crowley. He went to Buddhists. He compiled everything he could possibly get his hands on to try to come up with something for us. Yeah, he uh, he also uh, delved heavily into LSD. <laughs> yeah, and and he did that LSD. And then, you know, I always get a newcomer goes, "Well, he did LSD." I was like, "Yeah, but he didn't do it the way he didn't do it the way I did it." <laughs> you know, he was doing it more like the ancients did it to go somewhere as a tool rather than whatever. But so, you know, but he's still an alcoholic. So fuck, we all do crazy stuff. But uh, then the 12 step or the end of anyone's program, the, the apex is like, and then what? I always focus on the, and then what? Because to me, recovery is regaining control of something lost, stolen, or given away. And that's why I mechanics of recovery, the inner workings of regaining something lost, stolen, or given away. And I always try to think outside the box. And, you know, you're right. You know, you know, my group still, I'll start off talking about comic books or Dharma or hermetic law or the universe. And, you know, they're like, where are we going with this? But it's exciting. I like what you're saying. I wonder how he's going to tie it in. And my job is to all of a sudden smack you in the head with it. You know what I mean? Go, oh my God, I didn't see that before. And I love doing it. And it's exciting. And it's exciting for me. And, uh, enthusiasm is to channel the divine and if i'm not enthusiastic about it if i if i'm bored with what i'm saying i know they're bored with what i'm saying <laughs> you know and as long as i'm entertaining myself at least they're going to see me entertain <laughs> and i always felt you know like the 12-step program i too was you know the same thing i i got heavily involved in it i got the sponsor i worked the steps you know i did all that stuff and i eventually reached a place where i felt okay, this is all this has given me at this point, you know, I need something more. And, and that was for me was I'm always striving for something new to learn something that, um, you know, is unique, you know, the, uh, the ability, I, I too, I worked for a program, and um, I taught a Thursday night group, educational group, uh, I did it for over a year, and I never repeated it twice. Right. And because also I had a lot of the same people, it was a, it was an alternative sentencing. So these people were there a long time. Right. Right. You know? And so yeah, I didn't, I didn't, want, new. Yeah, I didn't want to bore them. I didn't want to, you know, I wanted to, to always create something exciting. And that's what I, that's where I always felt that you and I really clicked in, in our mind, in our thinking, you know, definitely. And, and, you know, and I, I get it to, you know, I loved your uh, what, monologue. I love the beginning because that is, I mean, obviously this is a business. If it's a treatment center or rehab or a mental facility, there's going to be an element or a hospital, or any, I mean, a car dealership, it's a business, you know, we got to keep the lights on. People can't be broke, <clears throat> but, and, you know, I, I, so many times, you know, people, they put too much into that and not into uh, the, the inciting the client. If the client is not excited, I don't care if you have the most cutting edge sonic crystal therapy, mind wiping alien technology. If I'm not going to pick it up, then you're not going to see me benefit from it. And that's just a fact. Yeah, I mean, that's the hard, the hardest part about it is, you know, like number, first of all, getting them into treatment right. and then keeping them in treatment, you know? Right. And if we can, and I've, I've said this so many times that, you know, if we don't have we need to intrigue them. We need to get them interested. I mean, that's the thing. And I don't, I don't see a lot of that in treatment, you know, like people no. come in, okay, sign these documents, read this, you know, it's almost like a punishment feeling, you know, we're searching your shit, you know, <laughs> right. You know? And uh, yeah, very black and white, you know, and, um, and I've always felt that, you know what, if we can get people excited, if we can get them to see that, you know, wait a minute, this isn't punishment. You know, you are working to better yourself, reaching your goals, your dreams, or something better out there for you. And right. that's what we want to impress. And, and 
you know, CBT and, and, you know, DBT and all, they have a place, you know, and I'm not saying that, that, you know, we don't necessarily do that, but when, when we're looking at all of these places that are just focusing on, that's all we do. Now I will, I will give the one great exception, motivational interview, you know, motivational interviewing is a, you know, is in that realm. Yes. It's an evidence-based thing. Um, and it's highly effective. What I try to do is, and I even let the clients know, I let them in on this. Um, I'm very unorthodox. Uh, my, my ultimate intentions, I let guide my unorthodoxicity. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I know very well I want them to get a certain amount of things. So then I give myself permission to be unorthodox. And I'll let them know at any stage in the game exactly where I am. Uh, you know, they say, oh, Paxton, you know, this treatment center lied to me. They said we were going to be up in the mountains and we actually were on the beach. I said, so what? I said, I'll lie to you right now. Your addiction is going to lie to me. I'm definitely going to lie to you. Uh, it's not a lie like, ha ha. It's like a paramedic lie. Like, oh, sir, you're going to be okay even though you're missing your guts. I'm just try I'm trying to get you out of crisis mode. Hell yeah, I'm going to lie to you. Or, uh, you know, I tell them, I say, you know, I'm trying to get you excited for the parts of the program that are not exciting. You know, I'm going to infuse you with excitement. I'll run a two hour long group. I'm supposed to go an hour and the clients will be like, dude, I don't want to leave. Hold on, finish. And I'll say, but you have to do that other part too. Now go to your therapist and talk, 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 talk. Now go to a meeting. Oh man, can't we just have you? No, you can't just have me. But I think a lot of it is because I'm letting them in on my own learning process and I'm a mystic. I'm definitely uh eccentric and esoteric so as i'm doing all the different weird things that i do in my head and in my practices and in my craft i'm learning and i'm also going you know what they would benefit from this Ooh, that one kid i bet you you'd want to hear this so i'm coming in ooh, ooh, ooh. guess what i just learned blah you know ooh, ooh, ooh. this worked for me what do you think about this and and there and that i'm excited genuinely for it because i just learned it or maybe not just learned it, but, you know, I just went through it or I just mastered it or this is something I came across, some research I did. And I think that element is missing a lot in a lot of things, whether it be teaching, counseling, therapy, selling cars, uh, parenthood, anything. It, we should be on the cusp of that excitement yeah. so they can feel it. And I believe wholeheartedly in energy. So it's like to feel it. I, I get a lot of places. Uh, I've been doing it for 20 years. And, you know, places will say, Paxton, you know, why do you have an intern certi uh, certification? I go, well, because I'll let you guys do that. <laughs> I know you need to have it, but I don't. I'm on the board of the NAA, uh, what is it, the NADAC? I'm on the board of the NADAC and I only have a KDAC. <laughs> it's like, but that's, that's just me. That's what I'm going to do. You know, I'm going to. You do consulting. Yeah. Yeah. Outside consulting. Uh, and for a long time, there wasn't even a name for what I did. I was doing consulting and treatment before it was uh, even popular before yoga teachers and people were going in to do ropes courses and music groups. You know, I was just going into places and I said, I'm, I'm, I can't work for you, but I'm going to come in and do a group. And if you can charge for it, fine. If not, I'll do it for free. I don't care. I just want to talk. And that's all I'm going to do. Uh, I don't want to be on the treatment team emails. I don't want to, <laughs> I don't just let me master my hour. I guarantee you the clients will love it. And I'm out of here. I want to be Tabasco. It's not the meat. It's not the fish. It's not the potatoes, not the salad. But if you go to a place and they don't have Tabasco, what the hell is going on here? <laughs> so where did it, where did this come from with you? What was your what was the real spark that kind of brought you to where you're at today as far as this mentality? Um, you know, and uh, in answering that question, I'm going to touch on one of my favorite lessons. And I believe in uh, transmutation and channeling, channeling of energy. Uh, I don't believe, and you know. We go to AA and places and they say, there's only one thing you have to change and that's everything. And I don't disagree with them when they say it and I know what they mean and I've probably said it myself, but we're really not changing. We're channeling. 
channel what's already there. Every emotion is energy in motion. And it's there for a reason. We use it. So my sociopathy, I'm a sociopath, just diagnosed. Uh, a lot of people say, no, you're not, because a sociopath would never admit to being a sociopath. And it's like, ha ha, still you. <laughs> Trust me, my mind does not work <laughs> the right way. But luckily for me, I found that what's best for me and what's best for others are usually about the same thing. They're really close together. So I channel that, you know, uh, and I use it. So to answer your question, I decided to do what was easiest for me. I decided to do what I was most enthusiastic about, uh, what I loved, and I did not love case managing. I just didn't. I was great at it. They loved me, but I just, ugh, ugh. Biopsych socials and doctor's appointments, oh, I want to blow my brains out. All the notes. I would see <laughs> notes. Ah. Uh, you know, it's just, ugh, I didn't care. And I would tell them, I don't care. I don't care where you're from. I don't care. I don't care. Your drug of choice, it's just another room in the Titanic. I don't care. Uh, I don't want to hear the story. You tell the story to somebody else. I don't need to know what you are cooking to help you clean your kitchen. Now, you do need to learn how to not make another mess. But I'm just cleaning your kitchen. That's all I want. 409, Swiffer Sweepers, you know, SOS pads, let's clean. And so I guess that's a good analogy. And I've always been... I've always had a silver tongue in my addiction in sobriety. I, I just have that ability to talk my way in and out of whatever I want. So I'm going to use it regardless. I might as well use it to help people because I'm going to use it. Use your talents. Right. Right. Yeah. You're, you're, uh, you know, just in talking to you and, you know, conversing here, I mean, you have that energy and I agree with you. I mean, I think that when you can, you know, if I'm sitting in a group, you know, and I'm listening to people, you know, you know, you've got the people that are just like, wah, 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 you know, kind of thing. And just very monotonous, you know, right. But then you have people like you, you know, that, that really bring about something big, you know, this excitement, right. you know, I mean, and it is, you know, the energy you talk about, you can feel it. The vibe, the energy, and, you know, and I am unorthodox. So, Yes, I am dressed up well. So, you know, then people are like, oh, wow, you know, did you dress up for us? And I tell them, I say, well, why do you dress up for a wedding? Out of respect for what's going on. And I don't want everyone to dress up. It's just that's what I do. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I'll play music on the way in and I'll get, you know, get them jazzed up. And I'll, I'll tell a joke and da, da, da. And I learned that from one of the people who did one of my lectures when I was early in recovery. He would get us laughing. Mm -hmm. and that would open us up and we'd expose our belly and then he hit us with a gut punch <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. we'd be like ah, ha, ha. he'd be like yeah you know that's messed up right and we'd be like whoa 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 you just turned on us oh my god you set us up yeah if you can get people laughing i mean that's that's kind of the typical you know um a lot of presenters you know right. We'll start that way, you know, to get the humor, get the laughter, get right. people engaged, you know, in the process. Right. Yeah. So you uh, now, obviously, you had a drug problem yourself. Yes. You went through that whole thing. Yes. Um, Started at 12, going on 13, and I didn't stop until 26. And I, I went really heavy. And, and, you know, the drugs, of course, were there. And and I, by all means, I am a junkie, an addict. Uh uh, alcoholic, a wino, and all that stuff. But it was also, I don't even want to say the lifestyle. I honestly just liked deception and manipulation. And because I was good at it, I worked for the police department and I was not a policeman. You know, I, I sold guns and sold gun locks. I talked my way into managing a restaurant. I never even bust a table. I don't even know how that happened. I, uh, you know, I uh, hosted a rap show on TV. I ran an escort service. I just, I lived under a bridge. I lived in Mexicali. I just, it was almost like I was compiling a horrible comic book story. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and anything weird, I was like, yep, sign me up. <laughs> the weirder, the better. I must have known eventually I'd end up in a treatment center telling my story because what the hell? 
How much do you think? I've never really asked people this. You know, obviously I'm in recovery and I have my my experience of, you know, I was a horrible meth addict. And I mean, right. I, you know, um, and I can answer this question for myself. Right. I'd like to ask you, and I've never really asked people on this podcast, you know, sure. Your life experience with drugs, how has that helped you with working with these people? Well, one, obviously the qualification, because, uh, you know, I can be the best doctor there is, but if I try to teach a Lamaze class, sooner or later, somebody's going to say, but do you know, <laughs> do you really know though, buddy? <laughs> or is that just your guess? So obviously the qualification, you know, I have to uh, qualify, but um, it helped me because I think the best example is the mutant, you know, you, 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 the comic book X-Men. So they're a normal human being, except for they have an extra gene in them. And this gene activates around puberty. So around puberty, strange things happen in this person's life. Lasers shoot out of their eyes, wings sprout from the shoulder blades, whatever their magical power is. And they hate it. They feel cursed. And you as a reader, you're going, man, give me lasers. I would love it. So the reader sees it as a blessing. The character sees it as a curse. And it causes so many problems that either the government or their family sends them away to a house run by other mutants. <laughs> and they train the mutant how to hone and channel their powers. And either they can leave and act like they're normal, leave and try to take over the world, or stick around and teach the next group of jerks that come through the door. And the ones that stick around are called X-Men. So... it's a great analogy, uh, actually. <laughs> so it finally gave me a use for my powers because I'm going to have my powers regardless. I mean, I'm in a treatment center right now. And when I was walking up, I saw two cars with the doors open. I'm going to, my vision is going to see that that's never not going to happen. <laughs> I do my sugar like this, not like this. I mean, that's a part of me. So either I'm going to use that power to help them or to help myself, but I'm going to use it. Mm -hmm. And so I think it really helped me, you know, have something to focus that power on. I mean, if Superman uses his heat vision just to warm up coffees, then that's a horrible waste. Yeah. 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 It's, you know, it, it really, and I, and I thought about this, you know, with me, you know, it's like, and just kind of like you said, I mean, it's like, I can go in, you know, I can hear the bullshit from people. I can understand what they're saying. I can even understand why they're saying what they're saying, you know, right. um, you know, I can have, the real empathy because I've experienced the, the horrible depression as a result of getting off of the drugs and have right. that empathy and, and to be able to highly relate to it from a personal right. standpoint, you know, now, again, I'm not discrediting. There are counselors out there that have never been through it that are fantastic yeah, counselors. Exactly. You know? um, but I think that makes it easier for us for a little bit. You know, you know, Eric, I'm glad that you said that because, even though I am an addict, I would actually fall under one of those other people who aren't addicts uh, in the way that I don't really have empathy. Like, I don't have that in me. And I'll tell them, I don't, I don't have that part. So I'm not a good grief counselor. I'm not going to help you with that. That's not me. I, I almost go in there expressing a lot of the things that they're working out of. The addiction given sociopathy, the disconnection, and I have all that. Well, see, see, empathy. Now, empathy, though, is just to understand. True, true, true. Now, sympathy right, is, a is the other, the flip side to it. Very true. And, and that's exactly. I have the understanding. And, uh, and I'll tell them, you know, my job is to, uh, my job is to populate my general vicinity with people who are doing better than me, who might owe me a favor or two. Like, literally, it behooves me for you to get better. <laughs> I, uh, one time, uh, I was in a group and I said, you know, I suggest you guys meditate and pray. And I said, now, according to HIPAA, I cannot tell you to pray every morning, and every night. And then I looked around, I looked at the cameras. And I said, luckily for you guys, I don't care about HIPAA. Pray every morning, every night. And if you want to sue me, then get sober, get a lawyer, sue me, and I'll be in court happy that you stayed sober. <laughs> you know, and they're like, this guy. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm dead serious. And at the same time, someone will say, you know, I'll get a client. And, oh, man, 
you're just rich and nice watch. And I said, dude, you prove to me that you did your fist step. I'll give you this watch right off my wrist. And I'm not rich, but I'll you know, do you, it. Yeah. You said something interesting though. And, and you know, when we're, when we're talking about ethics, yes. which is sort of what you're talking about, right? Yeah. Ethics. Okay. So, yeah. you know, I teach at a school and one of the, the mods that I teach is ethics, right? I teach right. people working to become substance abuse counselors. Right. And when, when you look at ethics, okay, ethics are rules that you originally set. But what do we say about rules? They're meant to be broken, right? And this is absolutely true with ethics in this field because, right, if I'm looking out for the best interest of my client, which is beneficence. Intention. Right? Intention. Yep. And I'm not doing harm, non-maleficence, okay? Then you got justice and then you got autonomy, Right. right that there are times where you will violate the, and that's what we call ethical dilemmas, you know? And so if I make a decision to do something that falls outside of ethics, but it is absolutely in the best interest of the person I am working with. And I can validate that you're not going right. to get in trouble. Right. Desertion. I, th there is nothing I've ever done that I wouldn't be in a courtroom and go, yep. And the judge go, I see exactly what you're doing. I see why it worked. And I hate to say, I always base what I do on results. And it's like, I get great results. And that's all. I mean, how could it be wrong? I get good results. Uh, this kid's head popped out of his butt. He walked away with my watch and he's on his fist up. And, and now he owns a treatment center and he's giving me a job. Okay. Right on. You know what? <laughs> <laughs> It's what like would you perfect. say? What would you say statistic wise? I mean, as far as like the the success. I mean, obviously you go to program, so I mean, it's right. obviously you're only doing one part, right. you know. Right. But as far as results of what you see for you and what you do, well, as far as my as far as my groups go, I would say ninety nine point nine percent, with the exceptions of people who have to leave because they're detoxing or they threw up or they had an appointment or. You know, uh, they were distracted by the person next to them. Uh, honestly, that's just, uh, I've never gotten a bad result from one of my groups, except when they didn't like it for the first two times. And then the third time they go, you know what? I hated you and now I love you. So I've gotten that. Now, as far as success goes, you know, I hand my card out. And I started doing that before I was allowed to. Uh, I'd hand out my own card. And I still do it. And, um, you know, I have former clients hitting me up on TikTok and on Facebook and Instagram uh, for my videos, obviously, and stuff like that. And uh, I hand out my card. And it's not because I'm going to client broker and it's not because I want to be the therapist or the sponsor. Because my first question is, what's your sponsor say? And then they're like, oh, man, I thought you were going to give me something else. I'm like, no, I want to know, did you follow my first advice <laughs> or else I'm not giving you any more. But uh, people reach out to me. Uh, a lot. I'm, I'm my own alumni group because people reach out to me and say, Paxton, you know, I'm doing good or Paxton, this happened or, or sometimes, you know, Paxton, I need treatment again, but I have an army of people over the last two decades that just keep me in their life. And they say, you know, you're doing something that sometimes these places couldn't or wouldn't do. And that's still care. Like they, you know, I, I, Paxton, I just want to show you a picture of my certificate or my kid or my, you know, or me shaking my ex-wife's hands. Remember that chick I said I hated and I want to kill her? Look, look, this is us eating dinner or whatever. And and I stay in their life because this is an ongoing thing. And obviously, I understand why case managers and therapists can't. But that's why my role is is. I don't know. They call me the recovery mercenary. <laughs> you know, it's just like, that's why my role is I'm, I'm a different thing. And I think they need that. Uh, also because uh, I offer a lot of, you know, my, a lot of my groups, they're not 12 step, they're 12 step compatible, but not exclusive. So I go into other places where people aren't addicts per se or whatever, because, you know, you go to a meeting, you get your treatment. That's awesome. You go to meetings and you're getting fed and doing what you need to do and you have therapy. And then once a year, maybe you get a convention, but then it's like, okay, but what if you want some more of that therapy 
and don't want to relapse to get it. What do you do? I'm going to put my videos online. I'm going to let you be in one of my Zoom lectures. I'm going to do an event. Uh, a while ago, I uh, did it right before the pandemic started. I did an event. It was called My Two Cents. And I charged them a penny, a penny for my thoughts. So it's a penny for my thoughts. You get my two cents. And it was basically free, you know, and and they're like, why are you doing this? And I'm like, well, because because I can. Mm -hmm. And I think they need that. You know, they need that, especially since I'm a I'm, I'm realist. Treatment centers have to get paid. So. The fact is they have to get paid. So since they have to get paid, clients need to get something where they don't have to get paid. You know, I'm not saying treatment centers shouldn't get paid. I'm saying since treatment centers have to get paid, I'm going to do some stuff for free to balance it out so that people get what they need to get. And you care. All right. So that, that, that moves you away from sociopath. Well, it, it <laughs> kind of. <laughs> because it's not caring is one plus one equals two. I don't care. One plus one equals two. My math is a whole lot more than that. It's 1000 divided by 62 sine minus three. To, I will get the same results, but that thing isn't there. Uh, you know, you talk to a surgeon, they care, but whether you live or die, they are going to still eat dinner with their kids. They have a certain sociopathy, not psychopathy, but they do have a certain antisocial yeah, way of Yeah, absolutely. Thinking. No, you know, and the thing, you know, I think those of us that work in this industry, okay, that survive the industry. Right. Okay, have to have that quality, right? Because, you know, no, I've been, you know, I have seen, sadly, I have seen, I couldn't even give you a number, how many people that I've worked with that left and are dead, you know? Right. Um, and... I don't go to funerals, you know, um, it, actually, no, that's, I, I went to one and there was a reason I did. Right. Of course. yeah. But typically I don't go to funerals. Um, I sleep fine at night, you know, um, and, and the reality being is just because we, and I think it's something that forms within us for those that, that make it in this industry that we, we have to have a numbness, you know, right, right. we have to have this disconnect because it is a reality. Right. You know, you are going to work with people that are going to leave and they are going to die fairly quickly after they leave, you know, and it's, it's a sad reality. The funny thing is I work the best with, I mean, I, I love everyone and I work well with everyone, but the, the two uh, paradigms I work the best with is borderlines and sociopaths because I teach them they, 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 a sociopath, literally, you know, this guy, he's like, oh, my God. I thought I was crazy and that I'd have to do acting for the rest of my life and acting like a person that cared. And I said, no, you don't. He's like, you're giving me freedom that I can be me because that's the whole beauty of sociopathy is it's antisocial. Mm -hmm. So my only result is to either participate in it and get bad results or act like I don't have it and I think another way and thus get more and more distance from myself. And I give them the third option, which is, you know, be you, but channel that, not change it. Uh, you get to keep the claws, Wolverine, just point them that way. <laughs> and it's like, oh, and, and it's really, it, it's a, it's, it, it's a basis of my, my teaching is, channeling alchemy transmutation using what's there you know a lot of people don't know martin luther king he was a borderline personality he tried to commit suicide seven times before he was 20 but he channeled that without that problem he'd be a no-name pastor nobody ever heard of you know uh with a bunch of suicide attempts but so i i really try to give that to them so they they can feel validated. I'm not trying to hopefully change something in you. Keep that. We're going to use it. <laughs> you know, you yeah, it's need funny. that. It's funny what you're saying. I got recently, my wife and I got into this. We were watching Dexter, 
right? And, you know, Dexter is the epitome of that story. You know, he, I mean, he's a serial killer, right? And yeah, his yeah. father taught him how to channel it into right, a right. better direction. Right, right. <laughs> if, if killing is a better direction anyways, right. but, but it, you know, it's kind of based on, but, but I, I do believe that, I mean, substance abusers are antisocial by nature. You know, right, people right. that abuse drugs. I mean, it is. Yeah, that trait is going to be there when we're yeah. using. We're, we're the Winnie the Pooh of every p- possible issue a human being could have. Uh, you do educational. That's kind of primary what it is, education, yes. right? And, um, and you said you have created over 100 different topics or yep. presentations that you do. It's on 150 probably now. And is it, and honestly, I would say probably that uh, it's almost every time that you do it, it's something different, Yes. you know? And so, I mean, you're, you know, at 150, but you're not going to do, you know, when you did before. Cause, and, and again, that's the way I've always been is I, you know, I'm always thinking about something. I'm always thinking about new ideas and different things. What's going to reach somebody? What is going right. to be, what's going to be the thing that could potentially help me drag that person, you know, um, you know, as we try to figure these people out, I'll go in wearing my Freemason necklace and they'll say, you're a Freemason Illuminati. I'll go, okay, let's talk about it. And I'll tell them what I can. And we'll talk an hour and a half about it. And then it'll smack them right in the face with their own life. Or we'll talk about sacred geometry or Dharma or the seven laws of success or hermetic law or quantum physics, the beginning of the universe. Uh, I'll go all, I'll go everywhere. And but you always bring it back because all things are connected. And that's what I, tra- and that's literally the, the, uh, ulti- the epitome of my teaching, whether it be spiritual, emotional, mental, or even when I was in detox, all things are connected. You cannot separate your kidney from your liver. You can't separate your engine from your alternator. I can't separate me from you. We're all in the same system. So how one thing interacts with another thing, that's in the same system, how they don't interact is their interests and how they interact is their relationship. And then I'll say, you know, everything's about relationships. Well, what is addiction? A pathological relationship. You know, what are the 12 steps? Crash course in relationships. You know, uh, what's, what, what is the worst part of your day right now? Your relationships. I say, everyone's pissed at you right now. And if they're not pissed at you, they should be pissed at you. <laughs> so, Every relationship sucks right now. And if it doesn't suck, it should suck, which means it sucks. And it's like, and then relationship with yourself and relationship with, it's all about how things interact. So no matter where I go, it's going to touch something else. It has to, or else it's garbage. It's creative. It, it drags people in, pulls people right. in, you know, um, and that's really what we're trying to do. You know, this one, this one kid, he came, uh, he came from, uh, and now now he's married. He works in treatment. And he's great. Matter of fact, I'm going to call him up and ask him to borrow, loan me some money. But he he comes in and, uh, joke, but he comes in, right? And he had just gotten in a fight with a, a staff member at another treatment center. So everybody's all worried about him. And I said, ah, let me get it. So I come in and they brought him into the bathroom to do his pee test. And I looked at his stuff and I saw that he smoked Marlboros. And I don't smoke Marlboros, but I saw that he had maybe 10. So I went and st- stole his Marlboros and I went outside and I threw them in the dumpster. Then I went to the store and I bought a pack of Marlboro Reds and I put them in my pocket. So I came up to him. I said, hey, how you doing? My name is Paxton. What's your name? Fred. And uh, I said, let's go smoke, man. He goes, all right. And he goes through his things like, man, someone stole my cigarettes. Ah. I said, here, take mine. <laughs> and he's like, are you sure? I was like, yeah, dude, don't worry about it. I, I think I have some backup pack for my girlfriend, which were the ones I wanted to smoke. And so he has a pack of Marlboros now and we're smoking. And that was our connection. And about a week and a half later, I said, hey, buddy, you know what I did when I met you, right? Because <laughs> I'm always going to tell him. I will always tell him the magic I did. And uh, because I want credit for it. And he said, you stinky bastard. I said, yep, that's how much I love you. (laughs) That's good. You know, I I don't know if I've ever told this story, you know, but 
I had, um, I was doing a group and I was, you know, like the creativity part, right? I had a client um, that I was doing a group, educational group, and this client used to come in every week late, was always late. The owner of the place, you know, never wanted the clients to wear hats, wear glasses, you know, in the, in the groups and stuff. This guy would right. come in every week. He'd wear a hat, he'd have glasses, he'd show up late, right? And so, you know, I think after maybe the fourth time, Right. And I was thinking heavily, I was thinking, you know, I don't, I don't like to see people get thrown out because that's not obviously going to be a good solution. So what right. is it that we can do? And so I thought about it. And, and so I grabbed this guy after group and I said, check this out. Here's what I want you to do. Right. Next week during group, I want you to show up 10 minutes late. Right. I want you to have your hat on and I want you to wear your glasses. Right. And I'm going to confront you, right, with this situation. And I want you to let loose. I want you to just let me have it. I want you to scream at me, cuss at me. The only thing you can't do is threaten me. So right. only rule, right? right? And so, so he comes. And he's like, what? Yeah. And I, and I said, I want, to, I want to do a group on anger management. That's where I was eventually going with it. You know, I was going to do an anger management. And so... So that next week came, he shows up on time, 10 minutes late, right? Wearing his hat, wearing his glasses. And, uh, and I made sure that I stayed obviously very respectful, you know, obviously as a counselor and I got to, you know, um, I never stepped out of line, you know, and I told him, I go, look, I said, you know what? I said, you know, once again, you know, once again, how many weeks is this now that you, you know, show up late, you know, what is the issue? You know, why is it that you cannot be here on time? Right. And this was the most, this guy did fantastic. You know? <laughs> he's like, fuck you. I'm fuck. I mean, he's like, let it go. Right. And I told him the week before, and this was going to be really interesting. I told him the week before I said, once I go like this, you got to stop. Okay. And I want to see if you can do this. You know, it was kind of a control thing. Right. Yeah. And so I let him go on for like five minutes. Right. And he's just, so, I mean, you could have heard a pin drop except for his screaming. Right. Everybody was like, Oh my God, you know, like just look as crazy. And I did, I go like this. He stopped, right? I said, come here. He came up again, big hug. Everybody in groups like, what the fuck? You know, kind of thing, right? They're like, what, you know? And so that led me to anger management, right? Now Genius. here's the coolest part. This guy was never late again. He never came in with his hat or his glasses on. No. And I'll tell you, and I thought about this and I thought about the reason why. And I think it had to do with number one, all of a sudden he felt a part of, right? He all of a sudden felt like, wait a minute, now I'm a part of this, you know? I'm a, a part, part of the solution. Yeah. And, I uh, found a role. And he You're also giving me a too. role. Yeah. Yeah. hundred percent. And I think that's a lot of what it was, you know, I think that was a big part. And I mean, it was the coolest thing, you know, I did not know those results were going to happen, right? you know, but I thought, let's give it a shot, you know? And genius, uh, Eric, genius, <laughs> genius. But that's what I, I that. you know, that's where I really think you and I kind of click in that aspect, you know, it's like thinking outside the box. Let's think of what can we do, you know, right. that can, that can help these people, you know, we're never going to reach it. We're never going to reach everybody, you know, um, but all we can do is do the best we can and to engage people. And that's what it's about getting them engaged, you know, not right. just putting them bored and putting them to sleep and, you know, but going in with that excitement. Right. <laughs> and, and, and the, that falls into my definition of recovery because it wasn't for that kid. It wasn't about him being sober. Recovery it is about regaining something that he lost was taken away from him or that was stolen. And obviously it was, I'm not a part of this. No one cares enough to be creative. Maybe my dad just sent me to my room instead of being creative and coming up with another thing or maybe whatever, who knows what. But he regained something from that experience that he didn't have. He regained it. He recovered it. He recovered something. Yeah. And that obviously could open the door for him being sober. But the recovery comes first. Absolutely. So I want to ask you real quick. So um, for those people out there suffering that are struggling, what's a message you would give them? 
Well, my plastic answer would be remember to keep the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. <laughs> the main thing is to keep the main thing, the main thing. But, uh, but yeah, that's, you know, something to put on a sticker, but I think to really answer your question is, Find your Dharma. I studied under the Oracle to the Dalai Lama for a year and a half, and it's all about Dharma, purpose, 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 purpose for happiness. Now, if you are, if you are honestly happy doing what you're doing, then I can't tell you not to, but you're not. So let's find what's going to make you genuinely happy. And then some people will say, well, I was happy. I said, no, pleasure and happiness are not the same thing. I'm not talking about pleasure. My mom's happiest day was when I came out of her hoo-ha. Well, there was no pleasure in that day. So I'm not talking about pleasure. I'm talking about true happiness. Let's find what's going to make you happy. Um, there's a movie uh, with Ben Kingsley. And if you ever get the chance, uh, get this movie. It's called uh, um, You Kill Me. And he's a, a mafia hitman. And, and and he was also an alcoholic. He uh, would botch his hits. He would get drunk and hit the, shoot the wrong person. And so they, they intervened, the mafia intervened on him and sent him uh, to Buffalo to go to AA. And so he's getting his 90-day chip. And he goes, guys, I just got to tell you, I'm a hitman. Everybody's like, oh, my God. Well, do the 12 steps keep you from doing that? He goes, no, no I want to be a hitman. I just want to be a better hitman. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, you know, that's a joke, but it's like to find out what you want to do and then let's find out how to make that so. I think the best anti-drug commercial I ever saw, well, you know, first we had just say no. And that, of course, is like the uh, Al-Anon equivalent of a drug campaign. Just stop it. It's like, oh, really? Didn't think of that. And then we had the scare tactics. You know, this is your brain on drugs. And, and, you know, you can't scare an addict. But then this one campaign, this little girl comes on the screen and she says, my name's Sally. I like playing soccer. My soccer team eats burgers and fries after practice. I love my soccer team. Hopefully I become a professional soccer player. And then the screen went black. And on the bottom, it said, what's your anti-drug? It's like, find your anti-drug. And then let the rest fall away like dead skin. You know, unless you're honestly happy being, you know, then I can't tell you, you know, cool. <laughs> then do it better. <laughs> Be better at it, buddy, because you suck at it. <laughs> you know, that's the thing, like, in, you know, the industry, like, you talk about happiness. You know, so many people say that, you know, they're like, oh, yeah, I just want to be happy in life. But people don't teach it. They don't teach where you're going to find it. I, I put a whole uh, lecture together, you know, on happiness. Where are we going to find it? You know, the myths to happiness. Money will make me happy. Pleasure is going to make me happy, you know. If I can just get rid of my past, I'll be happy. You know, um, if I can overcome my weaknesses, I'll be happy. Right. And so, you know, and the reality being is, you know, happiness, it all comes from within us. You know, it's, a, you know, I always kind of say this, you know, with the premise of my show, high wall clean, right? High wall clean. Highness is not a property of drugs. It's a property of people. You know, highness comes from within. Right. And so, you know, and that's really what I, I'm trying to promote. It's like, let's keep getting high. But let's, you know, I who I love I love that title by the way. Uh, what's the one I can't remember who said the quote. Everyone knows it, and I always forget it. But it's uh, I don't do drugs. I am drugs. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm I am drugs, buddy. You know, and and the clients they see it. They're like, oh my god, you are higher than anyone I've ever seen high. I'm like, <laughs> you, you. I said, buddy, you don't understand. I just got eighty six from a bar, and I don't even drink. <laughs> <laughs> They'll 86 me from a restaurant drinking too much tonic water just because I, you know, but that's a joke. Obviously, I'm respectful, but it's just like I'm I'm on this thing, man. I'm on it. I'm smoking it. I'm drinking it. It's life is life is 
a hell of a drug once you learn how to shoot it right. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the thing. It's like I found today exactly what I was looking for through drugs, but I found it today clean and sober. I mean, and that's the key, you know, is that and that's, that's the key. beautiful thing, you know, because yes. I mean, it, when I do it clean, you know, the only way that we're going to stay high the rest of our life is clean and sober, you right. know, because I can't do meth just a little. I'm going to kill all my brain cells, which is going to destroy my ability. You know? Right. So the only way I'm going to get that is clean and sober. Exactly. So, hey, I want to ask you really quick. Um, sure. If uh, people want to reach out to you, if, if people want to find you, what, where, uh, where can they? All right. Well, first, www.mechanicsofrecovery.com. Um, that is my website. And I, um, I am offering... Uh, um, you know, group lectures, online courses. Um, uh, I'll let you know where my events are and I'll post as much content as I can fit on my website. Uh, also the new thing is TikTok. I, a colleague told me to get on TikTok and I said, no way. And I saw people shaking their things and dogs falling downstairs. I said, this is nonsense, but apparently there's a big arcane spiritual, uh, recovery presence on TikTok. So you can find me on TikTok uh, at Paxton Dickerson, P A X T O N D I C K E R S O N. You can find me on Facebook, Paxton Dickerson. Find me on Instagram, uh, Dickerson Paxton. Uh, I have my phone number all over the place. I'm not afraid to give out my personal phone number, 714 600 3587. I have, uh, haven't changed my phone number in 20 years and I don't plan on it. And uh, I will answer. And if I don't leave a voicemail um, and uh, yeah, it, you know, find me. And uh, if I can't help you, I know what can. And if you don't need help, I can entertain you. <laughs> and I mean, like it, it, there's, there's, I, I plan on being a part of the process. Hey, I want to let you know, I enjoyed getting high with you today. And uh, I want to thank everybody for tuning in to another episode of High Wall Clean. Keep getting high, but let's do it clean. I'll see you guys soon. Thanks. Thank you.